Hello. Good afternoon. The academic quarter is up. Um, according to schedule, we're supposed to be starting at 3.30, now it's 3.45. This is a leisurely paced conference, so there's enough time for everyone to meet and talk, and we're in no hurry, but uh, I would still like to suggest that we start the proceedings right now. And we have a, a series of three short uh, opening statements, the first of which is coming from our host today, Matthias Wagner, called the director of this museum, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthias Wagner K. I'm the director of the Museum Eingewandte Kunst, and it's, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this international conference. Why did we want to host this conference in our house, a museum for design, applied art, fashion, and more? Tropical Underground is a year-long campus event which ties together a number of locations and institutions in Frankfurt in the joint exploration of a crucial moment, not just in Brazil, in history, but in global culture. The Museum Angewandte Kunst was the location for the start of the project, the official press conference last October. Now, Tropical Underground is returning here with an event that we feel is particularly suited to our house. If you look uh, at the program, you will find that this is truly a multidisciplinary conference covering not just the history and politics of 1968 in Brazil, but tracing the reverberations of this momentous event through all the arts from literature to visual arts and cinema to music and theatre. What binds all these facets together? If I understand the program of the conference correctly, is the idea that there is indeed a common thread that waves through a wide variety of cultural expressions, including not just the arts I just, just mentioned, it, but also visual communication, fashion and design. Tropicalismo, which is a pivotal element of what you will be discussing here over the next two and a half days, is a case in point. Lead by musician, cultural critic and poet Caetano Veloso, it was nothing if not a revolution of style, the fusion of rock and Brazilian popular music, but also a revolution in fashion, record cover designs, a Gesamtkunstwerk of sorts. As such, I would not fit in an art museum or a theatre or a cinema alone. A design museum, a museum of the applied art like, like ours, as a platform for relationships between what was, what is and what will be, seems like the right place to tackle the complex interactions of politics and style, or rather the politics of style, that are at the heart of Brazilian counterculture of the 1960s and 1970s. So I think in that spirit, I hope that you will feel, feel right at home here and have a productive conference. Welcome. Good afternoon, um, and welcome to the other uh, six eight anthropophagic revolutions in Brazilian counterculture counter after 1968. I speak here in a double capacity, as the president of the foundation of the Museum Angewandte Kunst and as co-curator together with Vincent Hediger of the Tropical Underground series. Tropical Underground come out of a conversation we had three or two years ago about Cinema Marginal and Brazilian culture and counterculture in the 60s and 70s. 
In that conversation, we discover and discuss the connection between anthropology and cinema, and more specifically, the connection be between the photographic works of anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro and the films of Ivan Cardoso for whom Viveiros de Castro had worked as a still photogra photographer in the 1970s. At that time, Sesc São Paulo was showing an exhibition of Viveiros de Castro's photography curated by Veronica Stiga and Eduardo Sterzi. We decided to bring the exhibition to Frankfurt and make it one of the two pillars of a large program that explored the connection between anthropology and avant-garde in Brazilian since the 1960s. As some of you may already know, a part of the exhibition, Tropical Underground, included the Kantorovich lecture, which Eduardo Viveiros de Castro gave at the Goethe University in November, a dispute about anthropophagy at Musantuam, and of course the lecture and film series dedicated to Cinema Marginal, which has been running since October and will continue to be shown in the Film Museum until July. The program also includes an evening of contemporary Brazilian literature coming up on June 13, again in Musantuam, and a screening of Helios Oiticica's Super 8 films at Sasfe Pavilion on June 22. And then, of course, there is this conference, a conference which brings the world's leading scholars of Brazilian culture and counterculture of the 60s and 70s to Frankfurt to wave all the treats of tropical underground together and provide a comprehensive view of this crucial period of Brazilian history and global culture. All this has, of course, only been made possible through the general support of our sponsors. At the top of the list, I want to mention the City of Frankfurt. The Kulturamt of the City of Frankfurt has been an early and enthusiastic supporter of Tropical Underground, providing the basic funding which made it possible for us to bring the other elements of the budget together. Our other general supporters alongside the city of Frankfurt include the Marschner Foundation, the Kulturfonds Fonds Frankfurt Heimain, the Vereinigung der Freunde und Förderer der Goethe-Universität und der Stiftung zur Förderung der internationalen Beziehung der Goethe-Universität. This conference has been made possible through the support of Thyssen Foundation. And finally, I, went, I wish to thank you the cluster of excellence, the formation of normative orders, which has been our most important academic partner, partner in all of this. Tropical Underground is in fact a cooperation between the Department of Theatre, Film and Media Studies at Goethe University and the Cluster of Excellence. And without the Cluster's personal and financial support uh, at every turn, we would never have been able to mount this event. And, what, and with this, I wish you all a successful conference, and I turn the microphone over to Vincent Hedega, who will say a few things about the conference, its topic, and its program. Yeah. Quick, quick succession of speakers. Yeah, hello and good afternoon also from me. Uh, as you can see here, my name is Vincent Hediger. Um, I am a professor of cinema studies at Goethe Universität and also a um, principal investigator in the aforementioned cluster of excellence, the formation of normative orders. I'm also, as you already know, together with Paula Macedo Weiss, the, the curator of Tropical Underground and as such the organizer of this conference. In this capacity I have a, um, a uh, uh, disappointing pit, bits of, of news to announce. If you look in the program for the conference you will see that we had scheduled a screening and that we, I mean the screening will take place of two films of Elena Inez, the big star of Cinema Marginal. And uh, Elena was actually supposed to be here, and May 23rd is also her birthday, so we were going to celebrate her birthday with two of her films, but sadly, um, just a few days ago, uh, the news reached us that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that Elena is uh, ill and has to undergo surgery and uh, couldn't make the trip. 
uh, I still want to invite you to uh, join us for the screening, which will be introduced uh, very, very competently by Laura Teixeira, the curator in charge of the Tropical Underground film series at the Film Museum. Speaking of Laura Teixeira, when Laura um, told her Brazilian friends, as you can tell from her name, Laura is originally from Brazil, when Laura told her Brazilian friends about this conference, which, as you know, is entitled The Other 68, Anthropophagic Revolutions in Brazilian Counterculture After 1968, the reaction of Laura's Brazilian friends was, this is a great title, what does it mean? <laughs> now, despite the instantaneous communication of which we are now capable, it may be uh, a few days before all of this reaches Brazil, but I will still try to explain just what the title means and what we had in mind when we came up with it and what we hope to do with this conference. I want to do this... Um, thank you. I want to do this very didactically, um, if you will, in three steps by answering... No, it's not working. Am I holding it? No, I'm holding it wrong. Ah, this is why. Um, I want to do this didactically by answering three questions, um, uh, namely why Brazil, why 68, and why anthropophagic revolutions. So let's start off with why Brazil. As you may have read in the conference flyer or on the website, our main intention here is to paraphrase it, is to look somewhere else. This is May 2018. 50 years after the storied events of Paris, 1968, the moment when a true revolution seemed possible, driven by an alliance of students and workers taking to the streets. The events of Paris, 68, is an event that occupies a key place in the Western collective memory and political imaginary, so much so that we can't but pause and look back on this event now and ask us once again what it really meant and what came out of it. And there are numerous conferences uh, doing just that happening throughout this year. Now, this being the city of Frankfurt, the temptation would be strong to continue to focus and even fixate on Paris in 1968. After all, the public face of the student movement, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, also known as Danny Le Rouge, or Red Danny, and not just because of his hair color, is originally from Frankfurt and continues to be an important force in the city's politics to this day. But as I said, our intention is to look somewhere else, to avert our gaze from the metropolitan center of 19th and to a large extent 20th century culture and focus on what appears to be the margins and the supposed periphery. But why should we look somewhere else to get a better understanding of the meaning of 68? Well, for one, looking somewhere else is a practical exercise in the critique of Eurocentrism. As recent shifts in the global power differential make clear, from the emergence of China as a global superpower to the so-called migration crisis and the, the waning of liberal democracy as the global paradigm for development, we now have to look somewhere else, even if our goal is ultimately to understand Europe and its future. But why look to Brazil? Well, since I've already mentioned Daniel Cohn-Bendit, we could actually ask Tim. Uh, four years ago, during the World Cup 2014, Cohn-Bendit shot a film on Brazilian football in the country, and so he might be able to um, illuminate us here. But as important as a part of Brazilian culture as football is, and as passionate uh, as some of us in this room certainly are about football, our focus in this conference is in other areas of culture, on the visual arts, music, literature, film, and on artists like Gaetano Veloso, who despite being Brazilian, is known for being entirely indifferent to football. So, why Brazil? One reason is because what happens in Brazil in the 1960s and 1970s can be seen as a model case and a paradigm of how globalized culture works. The fault lines and conflicts that structure Brazilian culture and cultural production in this time period illustrate, if you will, in an exemplary fashion, the conflicts and fault lines of what we might call a globalized politics of style. John Ruskin, the English art historian and cultural theorist of the 19th century, wrote somewhere that style, this is a quote, style is not a question of morality, style is the only morality. <laughs> 
Style, in other words, is where aesthetics and politics meet. Friedrich Nietzsche, a contemporary of Ruskin, further linked style to culture. Culture, and Nietzsche writes in the Unzeitgemäße Betrachtungen, is the unity of style in all forms of vital expression. Nietzsche writes this, of course, to deplore what he perceives to be Germany's lack of a proper culture as opposed to France. Brazilian culture and counterculture of the 1960s and 70s, by contrast, is, one could argue, all about the disunity of style, or rather, it is a culture marked by a style of conflict, a revolution of established cultural hierarchies. It is Western pop culture and rock music clashing, clashing with the Musica Popular Brasileira and Bossa Nova, which produced Tropicalismo. It is Western cinematic modernism clashing with the indigenous concern which produced, with indigenous concerns which produced Cinema Novo. It is American and Japanese popular cinemas clashing with the Western-inspired modernism of Cinema Novo, which in turn produced Cinema Marginal, but also the literary innovations of a writer and filmmaker like Jose Agrippino de Paula. It is a conflict which is even at the heart of the song that gave Tropicalismo its title, Caetano Veloso's song Tropicalia, which as uh, many of you will know here, is somewhat hesitantly named at the suggestion of Glauber Rocha's cameraman after an installation work by Elio Chisica. In Tropicalia, the song, Caetano Veloso evokes the site of Brazil's modernist new capital, Brasilia, which calls a monumento, while the chorus Viva a Paliosa celebrates a rather different piece of architecture, namely the Paliosa, the grass hut. It is, of course, no coincidence that we chose the Paliosa as the key image of our poster and flyer. What you see here is a detail, by the way, from one, it's a detail, from one of uh, Viveros de Castro's photographs, the roof of um, Amazonian uh, Paliosa. It is no surprise, I would argue, that Brazilian counterculture, and particularly Brazilian music of the 1960s and 70s, found such a strong international and even global resonance. The story of its immersion, emergence speaks to a condition which has now become that of cultural production worldwide. Brazil is indeed the country of the future, but not the, in the modernist utopian way intended by Austrian writer Stefan Zweig in his 1936 book, Brazilian Ein Land der Zukunft. Rather, Brazil is a nation that Eduardo Viveros de Castro, him again, has recently described as, I quote, the simulacrum of a failed European idea. A laboratory of post-nationalist culture, if you will, in which tension and conflict, rather than cultural homogeneity, is the unifying principle of style. Particularly in a time in which Europe is riven by its own tensions and in which the fantasy of a return to a homogeneous national culture gains traction, Brazil in the 1960s and 70s has something to teach us. But why 1968? A simple but powerful answer to this question comes from Victoria Langland, our keynote speaker this afternoon. Victoria Langland originally set out to write a book about Brazilian politics and the student movement in the 1970s as her first book project. The book is based on extensive ar archival research and numerous interviews with protagonists of these political movements. As Victoria Langland conducted her oral histories, she realized that every single source she interviewed used 1968 as the decisive point of reference. Every source framed what they had to say about the 70s by first stating what 1968 meant to them. 68, it appears, from this historical empirical evidence is a significant rupture, a true event, if you will, in the Deleuzean or Nietzschean sense, a moment of discontinuity and a point of crystallization of collective memory and certainly uh, in Brazil. In Brazil, 1968 is the year of massive student protests, but also the year in which the military dictatorship in response to these protests increased the level of repression and all but legalized torture. But 68 is also as I already sketched out, a turning point in the cultural life of Brazil, the year in which the rediscovery of the Brazilian avant-garde of the 1920s in theater and literature and the fusion of rock with popular Brazilian music produced phenomena such as tropicalismo, the year cinema marginal became a force, the year of a revolution in style. An anecdote involving Caetano Veloso's, Caetano Sorry, an anecdote involving Caetano Veloso can illustrate the extent to which 68 in Brazil 
was part, both part of a global wave of revolutionary unrest and was at the same time another 68, one that is different from the one that swept through Paris. After Veloso had written Tropicalia, his producer brought an idea for a song to him, a song based on a famous slogan from the Paris student unrests. The slogan goes, Il est interdit d'interdire, it is forbidden to forbid. Veloso first rejected the idea. For him, it was important to maintain a difference, to mark clearly that uh, our movement, as he said it, is not just an extension of that other movement. What was happening in Brazil and what he and the other tropicalistas were up to was different from Paris. But Veloso finally relented and wrote a song called Es Proibido Proibir, which he premiered on the national television show with the rock band Os Mutantes in a key moment of uh, the emergence of tropicalismo. This show, in turn, led to, a other, to another significant moment of rupture. The live audience, mainly composed of politically active students, self-declared leftist mostly, obviously hated the song and booed the artist and the band. This led Veloso to launch into an angry tirade against the students, which culminated in the line, so you are the young people who say they want to take power. If you're the same in politics as you are in music, we're done for. Or in other words, taste is not a question of morality, it is the only morality. Taste does not merely reflect someone's politics, it is inseparable from their politics. One might argue, of course, that in the face of military repression, structural inequality, and a host of other pressing issues, culture is a mere afterthought and of little political relevance. Yet, when cultural, Brazilian cultural theorist Sueli Rolnik, Sueli Rolnik and philosopher and psychiatrist Felix Catari wrote a book about the new emerging democratic Brazil after the end of the military dictatorship in the 1980s, a book called Molecular Revolution in Brazil, Rolnik and Gattari focused on culture and cultural events as the key sites where that molecular revolution was happening. That is, the progressive inversion of established cultural hierarchies that promised to produce a more equitable social order. Gaetano Veloso similarly speaks of the healthy destruction of hierarchies. In that sense, culture is not just a primary site of the revolutionary transformations of 1968, but one of the key sites where its consequences play out and continue to play out. And finally, why anthropoph an anthropoph <laughs> anthropophagy? It's a wonderfully complex word. In 1928, poet Oswald de Andrade published the Anthropophagic Manifesto, a manifesto in the, in the tradition of European art manifestos, uh, which uh, you know, took a turn on the European manifestos and proclaimed the Carib Revolution. It set out to define Brazilian culture in terms of anthropophagy, adapting to the realm of culture, a practice that had first been described as a distinctly Brazilian uh, uh, cultural practice by European travelers in the 16th century. And by the way, this, there's another connection to Frankfurt and Hesse because uh, the, the book that made the idea of Brazilian anthropoph anthropophagy uh, popular in Europe was a book uh, written by uh, a man from Hesse called Hans Staden who was captured as a soldier in Brazil and almost eaten by uh, the Tupi, um, but then um, returned to Europe to live the tale, uh, to, to tell the tale, wrote a book about it, and it became one of the first real bestsellers in the history of, of book publishing. Um, it was published in Marburg, just up the river here. Um, back to the Andrade, when uh, the uh, Anthropophagic Manifesto was first published, um, the Andrade's manifesto created quite a stir, but by the 1950s, it was largely forgotten, or rather, as Caetano Veloso would have it, in a Freudian fashion, it was repressed. It was the neoconcretist poets around Augusto de Campos who dis rediscovered the Andrade and reintroduced the anthropophagic manifesto into, into the Brazilian culture debate, uh, cultural debate in the 1960s, with significant consequences. To the tropicalists, anthropophagism provided the template for understanding what they were doing. The idea of cultural cannibalism, writes Veloso, fits, fits tropicalistas like a glove. 
while also distancing himself from the 1968 movement in Paris was a defensive move, embracing anthropophagism, the absorption of international elements of culture to digest them into an indigenous mix and product which could be re-exported, was the offensive move, the affirmative move. Oswald, as Veloso writes, launched the myth of anthropoph anthropophagy, bringing the cannibal ritual into the arena of inter international cultural relations, end quote. The concept, long forgotten or, replaced, uh, or repressed, remained contentious. Rogerio Scanzella, for one, perhaps the key figure of Cinema Marginal, offered a fierce critique of cultural anthropophagism, arguing that it only led to an indifferent mishmash and was devoid of any political relevance. While Gaetano Veloso argued that anthropophagy is a means of radicalizing the demand for identity, not a denial of the question. But whichever side you take in this debate, there is no question that Oswald de Andrade's manifesto provided a template through which Brazilian counterculture can be understood and through which artists and acti activists understood and in some ways continue to understand themselves, whether affirmatively or critically. Um, we will return to the concept of anthropophagism in contemporary Brazilian literature on June 13 as part of this program. So, to summarize my attempt at explaining and justifying our tantalizing but incomprehensible title, Brazil is the place where the politics of style of a globalized culture in which disunity is the principle of unity of expression emerge and can be studied in an exemplary fashion. 1968 is the moment when this dynamic, this revolutionary healthy destruction of cultural and by extension social hierarchies takes shape and anthropophagy is one of the keys, a template, whether you use it or reject it, which allows us to give a name to the politics of style at the heart of this revolution. All of which, of course, is subject to revision, or rather redigestion, during the course of this conference. So, without further ado, let us move on to our opening keynote. Nobody is better placed to provide a framework for our discussions over the next two and a half days than Victoria Langland. She's an associate professor of history with a twin appointment in Romance Languages and Literature at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where she also directs the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. She earned her PhD in history from Yale in 2004 and was a professor of history at the University of California in Davis and uh, Lafayette College before moving to the University of Michigan. Um, she is, if you will, the international authority on 1968 in Brazil, having published her book, Speaking of Flowers, Student Movements and the Making and Remembering of 1968 in Military Brazil with Duke University Press in 2013. And from the same press, she has a reader forthcoming on Brazilian politics and culture, I think this year, yeah. We're very, very happy that Victoria Langland has agreed to give the opening keynote for our conference today. Um, her title is Body Politics in 1968 Brazil, 1968 Brazil, Student Militancy, Gender, and Embodied Struggles for Social Transformation. Please welcome together with me, Victoria Langland. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you especially to Vincennes and to, for, for this invitation um, and to Lily for doing so much to set this up and as well as to Matias and to Paula for those, for those wonderful comments to get us started. This is, my, um, this is my first time in Frankfurt and actually my first time in Germany, which is shocking to say. And I didn't know that all Germans were trilingual in English, Portuguese, and German. This is an amazing <laughs> discovery. And I've heard Portuguese accents and Brazilian accents. This is like, who knew? So, no, really, you're giving me a quite, a quite biased micro, you know, perspective that I'm enjoying. I'm also really loving the chance to speak in a, in a space as beautiful as this. So thank you for that as well. Um, so I am especially delighted to be part of this extraordinary series of events that you've been holding all year. I wish that I were a little closer because I've been enjoying um, some of the videos of past speakers on the Tropical Underground Lecture Series, so that's a nice way of sharing this with everyone. And I'd say that this part of that series, this conference that we're kicking off, as we've just heard, aims to look at 
and now, thank you for mis, uh, pronouncing this word, so I now have pr permission to do, to do this as well, aims to look at anthropophagic revolutions in art, literature, and cinema in Brazil in 1968 and afterwards in the 1970s. Revolutions that, as Vincenzo reminds us in the conference description, continue to be relevant on a global scale. And as he very, very kindly laid out in the introduction, I suspect that the reason I was invited be was because I wrote a book about uh, student movements in Brazil in 1968, um, and some of what that, that year of activism later came to mean. And I'll just point out that when I say that I wrote about student, student movements, I don't just mean youth, but very specifically students who organized in the above ground, if still sometimes banned, student organizations like the National Union of Students, or UNE, and the many state, metropolitan, and university-wide unions that operated beneath it. And ironically, for this conference, these were students who at the time generally considered themselves quite critical of the counterculture, um, which they understood as not sufficiently politically engaged. And we already heard the anecdote about this particular event. Thank you for setting that up very perfectly because I thought that was a great way to kind of to lay this out. We might think about this well-known episode, right, as kind of emblematic of students' relationships in 1968 to what they understood the counterculture to be. Um, and these were also students who, in hindsight, would come to consider 1968 as having been the height of their movement and would come to think of the subsequent years as having marked the unraveling of what they had been trying to build an unraveling that was categorized by state repression and violence. And so as I thought about this, I thought, in some ways, my work might be a very incongruous fit to kick off these discussions of counterculture after 1968. And so for me, this, uh, this meant that as I thought about what to say, I have admittedly panicked a little bit and talked to Robert Stam about this at, at breakfast this morning, who said that this is common. Um, but I've also been inspired by the challenge to think about how best I can contribute to this conference in ways that might be useful to everyone here. And the question that has animated me and that drives my comments today is this, right? How can an examination of the student movements of 1968 in Brazil help us also think in new ways about the counterculture after 1968? And the answer that I want to get to today, and I'll say more in just a minute about sort of how I'm going to get to that answer, is that in thinking about the importance of gender for the student movement, in particular, the centrality of the gendered body helps us be more critical of the nature of social transformation that was experienced in 1968 and reminds us that change can work in multiple directions at once. And it helps us as well to think about the mechanisms by which the meanings of 1968 were constructed at the time, meanings that have also continued to be relevant and whose relevance one can similarly understand as extending globally. So that's kind of a nutshell of where I'm, I'm trying to go with this. So what I'm going to do today then is I first want to speak for a moment from the present at this moment of the 50th anniversary to look at some pervasive understandings of student movements of 1968. I'm then going to speak to some, um, what I see as some weaknesses in interpretation. I'm then going to make an argument for the importance of the body and body politics. And finally, I'll offer some brief conclusions about the importance of these constructions today. So I want to start then by kind of pausing here at this 50th anniversary moment. This is a moment of real attention from academics, from media, from elsewhere, and, the, and think about the ways in which this attention spotlights what are now, 50 years later, some very pervasive understandings of 1968 that I believe include Brazil, but also extend beyond Brazil ideas that we might consider part of the kind of global post-68 constructions of 1968, the way that we now have, have, have constructed this to be, to how we understand it. And in particular, <clears throat> I continue to be surprised by a pervasive paradox in many discussions of this period, a paradox that appears again and again, that on the one hand, 1968 is widely understood as a moment when ideas and practices around gender, sexuality, and the body all seemingly came up for debate and possible transformation, right? As US historian Sarah Evans has pointed out, for example, numerous studies of 1968, even when they give short shrift to gender, note in passing that that year led to dramatic challenges in gender relations. And she even wrote, notes, quote, in Western Europe, Japan, and parts of Latin America, histories of contemporary feminism invariably place its origins in 1968 even if the movements themselves usually emerged a year or two later. So we are kind of, you know, quite 
quite attracted to this idea that this really emerges in 1968. Now, we have this, but on the other hand, at the same time, um, I'm sorry, uh, both at the time in 1968 and now in our commemorative reconstructions, the iconic names and images of student protesters are overwhelmingly male. And we already talked a little bit about Danny the Red, um, and here each of you could imagine in your own heads the various well-known student activists whose names are sort of indelibly linked to 1968 from around the world, or the many photographs from student activities in 1968 that have been so often reproduced as to have become a part of our shared mental and visual repertoire. And so to think about the Brazilian case, I'm going to offer one kind of uh, collective example of this, which is the online photo essay that O Globo recently posted called 50 Facts About 1968, 50 Years Later. And now, of course, I know that one publication is not representative of all circulated images, and certainly O Globo does not have its finger on the pulse of Brazilian sentiment, necessarily. <laughs> um, but I'm going to start with O Globo as kind of a shorthand way um, of pointing to what we might think of as the mediascape, to use Apodora's term, of the Brazilian student movement in 1968. As he explains, these mediascapes provide large and complex repertoires of images, narratives, and landscapes of people to viewers throughout the world. These are kind of the the building, the, the visual building blocks by which we construct narratives about the past. Um, and the images that were selected by O Globo for inclusion in this 50 facts about 1968 piece have all, or mostly all, been widely published multiple times before. In other words, rather than me trying to sort of assert which photos I think have been most frequently republished, or worse yet, to actually count and do the kind of painstaking, you know, quantification of like how many times they've been published, which I really don't think I'm capable of doing. Um, I'm using this as a pre-selected set of well-circulated images of 1968, where most of the images here have appeared so often as to be widely recognized as the face of 1968. So just to give you an, uh, an explanation of Globo's online exhibit, consists of 50 photos then from around the world, although mostly from Brazil, the US, and Europe. I think there's one or two from Asia. Um, they're dated and they're ordered chronologically. And if you were can scroll with sort of a timeline on the bottom um, so that you can easily understand each image's temporal position in relationship to the rest of the year. And so the very first photo that they show, this is kind of a, a screenshot of the, of the online exhibit, <coughs> is this one, this very striking photo, chosen to illustrate the sexual revolution as a general characteristic of 1968. It's the one photo where the location and date are not identified. In every other photo, it says quite clearly sort of where it was taken and, and what, what year. Um, so it's different from these. But this is the image that initiates the viewer scrolling through time, while the accompanying text explains that 1968 was the height of the movement for sexual liberation. And in the 49 images that follow, 10 are of the Brazilian student movement, covering events from the period of March through October, and used in that way to highlight key moments in student movement activity. And I'm going to just very quickly kind of walk you through those 10 images to give you a sense of the overall message here. And I've, I've cut and pasted them out so I don't do screenshots of every single one, which would take way too long. So you can see them kind of, you know, all placed side by side. So the top two photos, many of you, you know, and stop me if you, you, if you recognize these all, and this is, you know, old territory. I wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page. Um, these top two photos are the death and then of the seventh day mass of Edson Luis Chilima Soto, a 17-year-old secondary student who was killed by the police in March of 1968 during a demonstration march in downtown Rio de Janeiro. That was the first student death of that year, and many date this event to the moment when the student movement began to really take on national prominence and when large numbers of students began to regularly engage in public protest. His death and the response of student movement leaders to it led to a series of massive demonstrations in Rio and across the country as students pointed to it as evidence that the military dictatorship was fast becoming a repressive force. The fact that the military forces tried to shut down these demonstrations as well, such as by sending mounted troops, helicopters, and DOPS agents to patrol Candelaria Cathedral during the masses that were held uh, on the seventh day after his death, um, only galvanized more critics of the regime. Then the bottom two photos are images of subsequent examples of police violence against students that also occurred in Rio de Janeiro in, on June 20th and 21st. Um, the first takes place in Botafogo, is, is the caption. These are captions from O Globo were when police encircled a university where students were holding an assembly and then beat many of them as they were exiting. And the second, an event students nicknamed Sexta Feira Sangrenta, uh, Bloody Friday, 
was when a demonstration downtown to protest those events led to further police violence, including three deaths and something like a thousand arrests. So what I'm trying to show in these first four images is that there's an obvious theme in that student movement activism is being defined in part by police violence against students. That's clearly part of this, this message. Um, if we look at the next four, these subsequent images highlight the two mass demonstrations that students organized in response to this increasing use of police violence. The Passeata de Saint Mil, or the, the March of the 100,000 in June, and the Passeata de 50 Mil in July, the 50,000 person march in, in July, both in Rio and both peaceful events. Um, in fact, the Passeata de 50 Mil would be the last mass protest of the year, due in no small part to a presidential order against any further demonstrations after that. Um, with these two, we can think of student movement activism as also being defined by the importance of mass demonstrations, right? That that's also part of the iconography, an indicator of support for student demands and the kind of peacefulness of those demonstrations. And then the bottom two highlight the imprisonment. Can you guys see them very well? Okay, all right. It's made my glasses. <laughs> um, the bottom two highlight the imprisonment of some student leaders, Vladimir Palmeira, who was then the president of the Metropolitan Union of Students in Rio Janeiro, um, who was first arrested in August 1968. Um, he was released a little while later and then later arrested again in October, but this is from the, the August arrest. And then oddly enough, this one, which this is the one that kind of falls outside of my spiel about these are really common and they've been reproduced multiple times. That's a very strange photo that they, that they put in, kind of cryptic. Um, it's chosen to mark the imprisonment of Onestino Guimarães, which actually makes little historical sense. He was abducted um, by the police sometime in 1973, but he was the last president of UNE at the time of his arrest, and the organization essentially disbanded for a period after this. And so his name is intimately connected to understandings of the student movement of 1968 in Brazil. So it's a, that's, that, that photo is an outlier in many ways, um, but I wanted to you know, do due diligence and show you what they're putting out here. Um, <laughs> and he constitutes one of the disappeared whose body was never found. So including him in this, in this uh, melange speaks to this vision in the first slide of the defining importance of state repression. So we might then see these two photos together as defining the student movement by their leaders and by the persecution against them. And then finally come these two photos from October. Uh, the first when students at two neighboring universities in Sao Paulo, Mackenzie and the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Sao Paulo erupted into violent conflict with the result that another student was killed. It's not simply a story of two sets of, of students though as rumors then circulated that an anti-communist group had provided the Mackenzie students with weapons and that the police had actively supported the Mackenzie side or at least refused to intervene so that there's kind of an ambiguous reading about what this means. Um, and then Ibiuna Sao Paulo uh, was where there was a clandestine conference for the National Union of Students, an event that was riddled by internal divisions and which would be raided by the police who arrested over 700 students. So we might see these last two as Globo's attempt to signal the denouement of the student movement as a mix of internal, and sort of internal divisions and external repression. That's the story that they're saying. So what I'm trying to say with this quick survey of 10 photos from 1968 is to give you a taste that will let you see one of my points, right? That in the same breath, observers regularly claim that 1968 was a moment of deep gender transformations, and they invoke the centrality of student activism to what that year meant and what it means today, even as that very invocation prevents student activism as decidedly male. Women were barely present in any of these pictures. Right? except as kind of anonymous figures helping to constitute the mass demonstrations. And I would argue, this is a small argument, but that this selection of images is actually a misrepresentation of the gender balance of the student movement, a selection that almost seems deliberately to go out of their way to erase women. Um, so if we went back to that picture of, um, of the students in Botafogo, their selection is really misleading because when the police lined the students up, they had them line up one line for men and one line for women. And so you just, Globo didn't include that, so you only see the men. Um, or for the Congress, uh, the Ibiuna Congress in Sao Paulo, 156 women were arrested. It was 22% of the total, so we know that there were lots of women there. Now this might be just a small quibble with Globo. My argument here is not that women protagonists of the 1968 student movement simply don't get the recognition that they deserve. That's not what I'm trying to argue. Rather, I'm trying to point to the ways in which the face of student activism is understood and presented as male, both in 1968 and even today. Um, so 
it should come as no surprise then that when people imagine a typical student protester from 1968, this figure is always imagined as a man. And I put up two cartoons, one from 1968, and another from 2013 where, you know, there is no photo, there is no real human being there, but this, you know, what does a 68 protester look like? Well, he looks like this in, in the imagination, right? In 1968, um, there's a picture of him in his suit with all of his kind of, you know, weapons of street battle, the, the, the slingshots and the stones that he's going to throw against a heavily outfitted military figure. Um, and then I love this cartoon that circulated in 2013 when there were lots of references being made to the parallels between 1968 and 2013. And I like how he has now been transformed into a hippie, which makes you know, very little sense for most of us to think that that was who was protesting in the streets with those signs in 1968, but that's how they're remembered in 2013. Um, but this is, my, my point here is that that is this, this crystallized image. And what's, what's more is that this paradox to me seems obvious and hopefully seems obvious to you but it's not noticed as often as you think it would be. You'd be surprised at how infrequently this is, this is addressed. Um, instead, as in this case, most often student activism is presented as gender neutral through the use of sort of gender neutral categories like youth or student or militanci or protester, even while the gendered ways in which students are represented goes unacknowledged. And when it is noticed, Explanations generally fall along the lines of one of three main lines of argument or some combination of these at the same time. And here I'm going to move now into the second part of my comments where I want to speak to some of the common interpretations of this gender dynamic and then to some of the weaknesses that I see with this understanding. So the three kind of ways that people do speak to this when, when, they, when they bring it up is first, that gender equality was simply not yet on the table for students. 1968 was one moment in what we might think of as the long 1960s, but in 1968, this issue had not yet reached prominence for them. And the implication here is that the 1960s were indeed marked by a kind of progressive move toward greater gender equality, but 1968 was just too early in that timeline. In other words, there's an implication that more expansive understandings of gender were moving in a linear way, in a kind of progressive way, but looking at 1968 is looking a little bit too early. That's one way that people have explained this. Secondly, and related to this, the idea that the student protests of 1968 and the counterculture were very different entities, and it's to the latter, not the former, that we need to look to find evidence of changes in gender norms. And indeed, if we go back to the early slide from O Globo, their very first slide is specifically about the counterculture, and it does not mention the student movement. So this implication, I guess it's really more explicit, is that these were totally different constituencies. Um, but we know from the work of people like Chris Dunn, who'll be speaking tomorrow, and others, that there was considerable overlap between the two, certainly more than was acknowledged at the time, when people spoke of an almost impenetrable divide between the decision to militar or to desplundar, um, or as we might say, to mobilize or to tune out, as if those were completely discrete categories of people. So, I would critique that, and I would also note that there's another implication here too, which is similar to what I said before, that the 1960s were indeed marked by a progressive mood, move toward ge greater gender equality, but you have to look in the right place to find this. Don't look in the student movement to find this. Look in the counterculture, and that's where you'll see it. Um, and then the third argument that comes out a lot is that this level of gender diversity among activists was pretty radical for its time. I've already mentioned that, you know, there was extensive women's participation. I think that's well, we, we know that well. And so people would argue that this very participation meant that explicitly gendered roles were up for debate, that it was deeply significant for women to participate at all given the expectations that were set for them. And of course, this is true in many ways, but I'd post, uh, or I'd posit again that this implication that gender transformations were taking place in what we might consider a progressive direction, i.e. toward more gender equality, um, and that other markers of this would, would later come here is kind of implicit in what this is saying. And so we might read this as saying that women activists' participation in the protests of 1968 contributed to this, that they helped open this path. And now I lay these out because I find all three arguments dissatisfying to one degree or another and I worry that they reflect more wishful thinking than truth. Um, and particularly as we're at this moment of the anniversary, I think there's a lot of, of real celebration of 1968 and, and sometimes um, 
with ways that don't always hand, hold up to scrutiny. I think that women protagonists of the student movement were acutely aware of the ways in which expectations about them and understandings of their behavior were different from those of their male peers, and that these expectations limited what they could and could not do. And I definitely see this as a period of shifting terrain in terms of long-standing assumptions about gender and sexuality. But what I do not see is a unidirectional, progressive movement toward greater gender equality. I do not see that as taking place across 1968. In the arena of the 1968 student movement, and this is you know, my, in my field of vision, right? So that's what I'm saying within the student movement. Women students could now attend highly politicized student assemblies and demonstrations. But interviews and memoirs suggest just how challenging it was for them to be heard in these gatherings, where assumptions about male oratory prowess and natural leadership dominated. They suggest, too, the ways in which their desire to get involved in student movement, student movement activities stoked real fear among their parents, who worried both about their physical safety and about their social reputations, which led to real constraints on what they were able to do. And indeed, being involved with the student movement implied being sexually active, an implication that had much different significance for women than it did for men. For notwithstanding the very real debates students did have about sexual liberation and the very real possibilities for sexual experimentation afforded by the growing availability of the birth control pill, male students who engaged in sex were celebrated for their virility, while women students faced approbation from many sides. In fact, much of this translated directly into the question of political voice wherein the political participation of women students was regularly understood as originating from their romantic partners, that is, that their boyfriends politicized them or you know, uh, brought their ideas to them, whereas male students were understood as bringing women into the movement through romantic partnerships as one of the conduits of bringing in more, uh, more adherence. Vladimir Palmeira, the student leader who we saw earlier, once jokingly recalled that he and others, other male students uh, derisively nicknamed women students who held onto their virginity museums, sort of seeing that inside of a museum, but as kind of like stodgy old places, right? We might see this as an example of the kind of social pressure women faced here masked as humor and also kind of camaraderie at their expense. Um, and meanwhile, one male student activist, Vinicius Caldevila, has said that he wasn't the only man at the time to embark on what he called passionate affairs with colleagues from the university, political militants, all while also having an official and chaste romance with a woman from the country club society of his upbringing. So his comments speak to the ways in which such sexual explorations held diverse connotations for male students who could easily lead both lives and different ones for their female colleagues who could not. So I'm proposing then that we might better understand women activists as facing new demands and limitations. And we might better understand 1968 as a moment marked less by progress in this area and more perhaps by retrenchment and even reaction. I think often of the case of Caterina Meloni, a woman who in 1967 and 1968 disputed the presidency of the State Union of Students of Sao Paulo with José de Seu. Each one of them represented different, different political factions. She was from Acción Popular, he was from the Dissidencia, both political factions said that their candidate had won the presidency of the, of the State Union of Students, um, and both accused the other side of voter fraud. But Derceo's attacks against Meloni went well beyond the kind of political jockeying of these, two, of these two groups. He disparaged her as utterly illegitimate, of incapable of leadership. His attacks were so personal that she dropped out of student politics, and for decades later she wouldn't even talk about it. And he, on the other hand, as you, you know well, went on to fame and later infamy as a national figure in the PT. And in his own memoirs of the student movement, he continues to write about Meloni in undermining ways. So what I'm proposing then is that notwithstanding the wide and important participation of women, the student protests of 1968 worked to construct and consecrate a political subject who was male, straight, and culturally understood as masculine a construction that limited the possibilities for women activists. And furthermore, I'd put that the mechanism for this construction might best be understood by considering the centrality of the gendered body in student protests. And so here I'm going to enter then into the, the third part of this talk, where I want to argue for a new kind of attention on the body and body politics. And when I say body politics, I'm not referring to it in the usual sense that the phrase is used of policies designed to control and regulate the body, 
such as taxes on alcohol or limiting access to measures to control fertility, with one of the kind of one way that we think about body politics. Rather, I mean to redirect our attention to the ways in which the body itself became a primary site of political activism in 1968 Brazil. And I'm gonna show you what I mean. First, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the city street as the site of student politics in 1968. And again, that probably already is you know, synchronous with your image of, of student politics, right? That the, it, it's so obvious to us that we might take it for granted. It's right? so iconographic that student protests of 1968 take place on the street. Um, but at the time, this was a, a relatively new chapter in student politics. And I don't mean that students never embarked on street protests in the past, far from it. But I would say that since, 1950, sorry, since 1942, one of the things that had granted authority and importance to the student movement was the fact that UNE, the National Union of Students, was not only formally recognized and funded by the federal government, but also that the government had given three student organizations, including UNE, a beautiful oceanfront building in Botafogo. Oh, sorry, in... in uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I suddenly couldn't remember if it was Flamengo Botafogo um, on Praia de Flamengo Street. Uh, this was a place where students from different universities could all meet together to organize their efforts. Um, and so I have a few, just a few images of that to kind of think about the significance of the building as, the, as the, the formal place of student politics in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, we have a, a booklet in 1951 up there, which was a booklet for those who were attending the UNE Congress, that they were, you know, coming, and this is kind of like part of the, uh, um, Part of the gravitas of attending the UNE Congress is that it's here held in this building and here's a booklet that tells you about this. Um, I have a slide. Students regularly decorated the outside of the building as a kind of place of political speech. So this was when Dwight Eisenhower was visiting uh, Rio and the Rio was plastered with posters that said, I like Ike. So students, of course, had to put their own poster that said, we like Fidel Castro. Um, and then the bottom photo is some, sometime between the construction of the building in 1929 and its handover to UNE in 1942. It was originally uh, a German society club, and that's an image of its veranda, like looking out on the, the Bay of Guanabara. Um, so this had been kind of this, you know, important site of, 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 uh, of national student level politics. Um, and this kind of symbolism of this space is one of the main reasons why the building was targeted in 1964. First, by coup supporters, who celebrated the mili military intervention by autonomously, sort of spontaneously going to the building, encircling it, jeering the students inside, throwing things into the window, eventually including throwing things that were on fire, burning pieces of wood that they tossed inside until the whole building went up in flames. Um, and then it was targeted by the military who barred UNE from re-entering and eventually handed the building over to the National Conservatories of Theater and Orchestral Music. So, in some ways, I'm, I'm arguing that this shift from the building to the street m marks kind of a departure for what student politics mean. So, others have noted that street politics means a kind of politics of spectacle, a spectacle only rendered more important when it is covered and disseminated by the media, as it was for many of the student movement demonstrations that took place in large urban centers like Rio and Sao Paulo. I want to add to this, <coughs> by underscoring the importance of the body in these kinds of street protests. Most obviously, we're talking about literal bodies in the streets, right, where the ability of organizers like UNE to fill public spaces with supporters was both a political tactic and an expression of their authority or the extent to which people agreed with them. And we, we saw that a little bit um, when we talked about, um, uh, oh well. Yeah, sorry, that was not the slide I was expecting, but um, let me see. That's the slide I was expecting. Um, so thinking about the importance that was given to crowd size, right? As more bodies in the street is read as a measure of organizer support and of their growing ability to organize. And there's a, there's a really interesting piece in the New York Times last week about how today with social media, getting bodies to the street is no longer such an issue. The question is always, what do you do after you've brought them to the street? But it reminds us that getting bodies onto the street in 1968 was a sign of real organization, right? You didn't kind of circulate texts and emails about, you know, getting people there that, that kind of, it represented a lot of legwork ahead of time. So that was just a little bit of anachronistic reminder. Um, but so we can think about the importance given to the side of the crowd. We can also think about um, students' decisions to place themselves in areas that are prominent as well as those that are kind of implicitly off limits, to climb up on top of walls, to scooch up lampposts, 
um, to, to clamber onto the hoods of cars. Places, yes, from whence they could see or from whence they could be heard, but also places where a body is not supposed to go, where they become visible not just because of their height, but because of the transgression of being there. And so there's images here um, of students. One of, their favorite, one of the tactics they talk about is you know, walking in the reverse direction of traffic to try to stop traffic, but also to like, you know, be able to speak to drivers as they, as they go by and the disruption that that causes and the attention that that brings. Um, and so their misplacement draws attention as much as the centrality of their downtown location. And indeed, another example of this, which I don't have an image of, is when students climbed into that former UNE building during the funeral procession for Edson Luis in March and gave a speech from its balcony, a building that they were not supposed to enter, but they kind of snuck in and went up to the balcony and gave a speech from there. So by thinking about student street politics as being a kind of body politics, it reminds us then, it kind of puts it back into the individual subject and reminds us that bodies are gendered. And this became especially clear when student police conflicts began to intensify. Let me see if I can get to the image I want. Yeah. So newspaper descriptions, once, this, um, once these conflicts really started to intensify, newspapers began to describe clashes between students and police, and they would pepper these accounts with kind of very daring descriptions of hand-to-hand -hand combat, describe streets as somewhat transformed into war zones, and they cast student demonstrations as not simply male affairs, but actually really as contests over masculinity. They reported on the ways, for example, in which police and students lobbed verbal barbs at one another, taunts that challenged one another's masculinity. For example, students at one demonstration would scatter into small groups and then reassemble again a few minutes later, a very common practice they use called lightning demonstrations to kind of you know, avoid police persecution. And a colonel told journalists that this was a protest march of cowards because they wouldn't stay in one place and just confront the police head on. And so you kind of can start to see this like jockeying back and forth in a way um, that gets written up in very dramatic terms in the newspaper. Um, and most colorful is a description of a street protest that has made it into at least three accounts of 1968. In the version of this anecdote that's drawn from the best-selling memoir, O Que Hizo Compañero, by Fernando Gavera, he writes of a police device that students mocked with the nickname of the Brucutu. Um, so the Brucutu, the images on the left, it was a special vehicle designed to spray powerful jets of water to disperse the crowds. And as the police were developing this, it was written about in the newspapers that they had this brukutu, they were going to bring it to demonstrations, and they were going to end the demonstrations with this. So there's kind of a lot of discussion in the newspapers. Yekabera recalls that the first time the police brought out this famous new weapon, directed it at students, and turned it on, only a tiny bit of water trickled out of the end. And all the students laughed their heads off, right? Um, and he wrote, I remember the psychoanalyst Elio Pellegrino, that marvelous character, screaming in his big voice in the middle of a downtown street, Gente, o brucutu brochou, which we would translate as, hey guys, the brucutu lost its erection. Um, so in this body taunt, the protest participants label the military's failure as literally male sexual impotence. And Gabera's overall narrative firmly characterized the students as he kind of described it as these formidable opponents who had managed to throw the police off course and that's why they had to bring out the brucutu in the first place. Even the telling of Elio, Elio Pellegrino's joke suggests a kind of male social space for the scene of him publicly screaming in his big voice, as he describes it, the vulgarity brocha, apparently to great laughter, evokes an image of shared masculine humor. In short, it's a kind of a humor that's not unlike the, the museum's comment by Vladimir Pamera. In short, the rising importance of physical combativeness as an indicator of student authenticity contributed to defining student militancy as masculine. This was a masculinity that was willing to put bodies on the line and who seemingly came away from skirmishes with police reinvigorated. And even, I would point out, students' nick nickname for the presumably powerful water, water cannon evoked a problematic kind of masculinity. And I, I thought that slide was going to appear later, but this is, um, Brukutu is a, was a, a cartoon of a caveman, and that's where the nickname came from. Kind of this, like, unthinking, you know, ham-fisted uh, military figure, or uh, masculine figure is the, is the nickname that they gave to this water cannon. Um, <coughs> so... These are some of the kind of ways that I've been thinking about bodies, right? Bodies in the street um, and the ways in which the importance of the male body as a combatant, as a, um, 
as a shared social mill space become part of how the student movement is defined. I want to look at one last example of body politics today, which takes us back to Ed San Luis. And his story is important for us because it inaugurated another important kind of body politics, one where the nation's democratic future, in this case a future that was seen to be at risk, was represented as the youthful male body. We mentioned him earlier when looking at those Oglobo photo exhibits, and probably most of you know this history well, but just in case anyone doesn't, I'll briefly explain a little more, which is that um, he was killed when a group of well-known activists, most of them secondary students, initiated a protest against the poor conditions at a student restaurant in downtown Rio Janeiro. The restaurant, which is known as the Calabuso, or the Dungeon, serves state-subsidized meals to economically disadvantaged secondary and university students, while also offering other kinds of services like academic tutoring. But it had recently and very controversially been relocated as the city tried to renovate the area where the Calabuso was located in preparation for an IMF meeting that was happening nearby. So an important political contingent organized there, drawn as much by the working class students who relied on the cheap, if, uh, if quite awful, food, as by the material sources of possible outrage, such as leaking sewage, cockroach infestations and other kind of structural calamities. So they saw this as a prime site for, for organizing and for political, um, political potential. On March 28 of 68, students had just set out to protest these conditions when the police fired on them, instantly killing Edson Luis. Edson Luis was not a known student activist, and from all accounts, he was either participating in his first demonstration or he was merely caught quite fatally in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was a poor secondary student from the state of Pará, who had come to Rio to study. He lived with extended family far from the city center, but he often stayed the night at the Calabuso in order to save himself from their long and expensive trip home. So we can see in his story, <coughs> first another example of the kind of bodily misplacement, right, of putting student bodies where they don't usually belong, in this case, entering formal arenas of power that were typically closed off for them, because immediately after he was shot, the group of students who were around him first rushed him to a nearby medical center, as they should, um, where doctors pronounced him dead. But then the group carried his body on their shoulders into an ongoing session at the state legislative assembly, so the, the, um, the state legislatures for the, for the state then of Rio de Janeiro. Um, they interrupted the session, carrying him on their shoulders to the front of the room, past shocked state legislators, and then they stretched out his shirtless, bloodied corpse on a very formal, wooden table at the beginning, at the, at the bottom of the auditorium, and invited in reporters. So the photo on the left is, is of Ed San Luis's corpse on that first day. Um, the second one is this following day when they departed from the state legislature with, with him in the coffin. So just to kind of emphasize my point about um, bodies in the halls of power in this kind of you know, disconcerting uh, moment. <coughs> but this is a small point about these kind of transgressive locations. More importantly, Students engaged in body politics in the ways that they carefully used Edson Luis's body, in this case his corpse, to communicate a message about what was at stake. They transformed his body into a material platform from which to declaim the murder and the military regime that they held responsible for it, inviting reporters to give witness to his death. And indeed, the very fact that he was an, um, an in, in, uh, a poor student far from home whose family could not and did not quickly come to claim his body allowed the other student activists an enormous degree of control over his corpse, and by extension over the events following his death, in which his very seemingly youthful yet lifeless body became central. And so we can see what happens. Um, and if you, if you look at these, you, there's, a, there's a whole tableau of what, what happens with his body. So after they placed him on the table, they gradually start to decorate his body, kind of transforming it into a tableau of their critiques. Someone brought candles, which they surrounded his body with, even placing one in his lifeless hand to hold on to. Um, undoubtedly, in response to the fact that photographers were coming in as they expected to see the body, somebody clearly decided to scrawl a message. Uh, the first one sort of critiques the policia asesinos, the, the assassin police, and they hold it in front of the corpse so that it would appear in the photos. And as you can see, others followed suit until his body and the table were plastered with dozens of these signs. So you can kind of see those you know, growing over time. And I always kind of look at the candles getting smaller to see the progression of time. Um, initially, somebody laid the flag of the Calabuso student group, the group that he had been protesting, sorry, the group that had been protesting that morning when he was killed. They had laid that over his body. Someone else placed a small paper Brazilian flag in his hand. And later, you can see that both of those were replaced 
by a larger fabric Brazilian flag that covered his waist and legs, kind of marking his death as not just something for a local group, but a national crime that had been committed. <coughs> they also deliberately left his bare chest mostly exposed. That one showed off the blood on his body, but also a compelling image of youthful male vitality that was denied. So throughout the rest of the night, they kept a careful vigil over him. Um, they even refused to allow the body to be temporarily removed for an autopsy and demanded that the procedure take place in the assembly room itself. The next day, students held an official wake for Edson Luis, still at the state assembly, displaying his corpse in an open casket for the thousands of visitors who streamed by. And for this event, his body was presented anew, this time, as you can see, almost entirely covered in flower petals and long-stemmed carnations, invoking the burials of children who are said to become angels as if they die, as they have not yet sinned. A Brazilian flag once again lay across his waist, again suggesting the kind of national dimensions of his personal tragedy, while over his legs, someone carefully placed open a geometry notebook that had been his, um, a deliberate marking of him as a student, preparing for the future as an engineer. Uh, students, students then jealously guarded this ownership of Edson Luis's body the next day during the massive public burial that they organized, one that wound in a funeral cortege throughout the city to the San Juan Batista Cemetery. They refused offers from supportive state legislators who said they wanted to help pay for it, um, and from the fire department who said they wanted to help transport the casket preferring to collect donations from cars and buses and to rotate pallbearers along the extensive funeral route. They said, we don't want to take any money from the state that if the state is responsible for his death. And they organized protests around the country where slogans like, he could have been your son, or Brazil, your sons are dying for you, cast his death as a national sacrifice, and cast it as if it was something that he had, you know, um, kind of signed up for, right? That he was willing to, to, to die for this cause. Um, and finally, I'll add that one of the most remarkable aspects of this example of body politics is the way in which students were able to take command of his body and thereby attempt to direct the meanings that, that would be attributed to his death, um, meanings that focused on his youth, his masculine vigor, and his future citizenship and promise. While two other students were killed later in the year of 1968, Students tried to replicate some of the practices that had followed Edson Luis's death, but they found it impossible, in large part because their families lived nearby, they intervened quickly, and they held private funerals and burials for their children. Um, but what I'm trying to point out is that they, um, um, th this use of the body was incredibly important to what they were able to do in 68. Um, and I'll note that Edson Luis has returned to the news in recent weeks, not just because of the 50th anniversary of 1968, but because there was another wake in the Legislative Assembly and another massive funeral procession from that building through the streets of Rio Janeiro. And I'm referring to the wake and funeral of Marielle Franco and Anderson Pedro Gomes after they were assassinated on March 14th. Um, and this is not a, an image that I put these two processions together. This is a, a meme that's circulating a lot on the internet right now where there are images of the, of the wake for Marielle Franco um, and, of Edson, uh, and of Edson Luis, both being compared as, both happening in March, 50 years apart from each other. For those of you who don't know, Marielle Franco was a state legislator, le legislator who was assassinated um, in March, um, and she was a, 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 a fierce advocate for a variety of, of, of constituencies um, and a fierce critic of, of police repression. Um, and so much has been made of the parallels between these two cases with pamphlets linking the three figures together and seeing them as engaged in the same basic struggle for a more just society. Ironically, the argument can really only be made for Marielle, who was an incredibly talented and committed activist who understood the intersectionality of gender, race, and class in maintaining political and economic exclusion. For Edson Luis and Anderson, we don't have evidence of them engaging in this struggle in life but in death, their bodies may do this work, that their bodies are the kind of political agents in this, in this vision. So, if I, to conclude, I wanna come back to that question that I asked at the beginning, which is how can an examination of the student movements of 1968 help us better understand or to think in new ways about the counterculture after 1968? And I've been proposing that reading the student movement of 1968 more critically may help us understand both the particular challenges of gender contestation and the urgent necessity that some may have felt for doing so. So in other words, if we think about um, the long 1960s and think that, that, that 
um, understandings of gender sexuality in the body were indeed contested in multiple ways, looking, kind of debunking the mythology that this all um, was already underway in 1968 in the student movement, kind of shows us both how challenging that was to redo these, and maybe the urgency that was felt, like maybe just how, um, how necessary this was, this was seen to be. Because as 60, 1968 today is hailed as a year of social transformation around the world, including progressive changes around understandings of gender, sexuality, and the body, this view does not hold up when we look at the student movement in Brazil. If we're speaking of the long 1960s, and this makes sense, but we would be doing an intellectual disservice to conflate that longer period of change with the iconographic 1968 that we are commemorating in this year, the 50th anniversary. I don't see 1968 as a moment of real progressive change in this area, not in many places and certainly not in the Brazilian student movement, nor do I see it as just kind of a delayed start or a slow movement that had yet to pick up steam. Instead, I believe that for the Brazilian student movement, 1968 might better be understood as a year of entrenchment and maybe even reactionary movement, and that it would take later generations of student movement activists a long time to undo some of the gendering work that had been done in that year and that has concretized the vision of political authority as male. And we need only think of the misogynistic attacks on President Dilma and the ways in which her political authority was questioned through references to her gender, that we can understand that we still have a long way to go here. So I guess my historian's final words would be that change does not work only in one direction, that it goes forward and backwards in multiple ways, even the changes of 1968. Thank you.